Hello and a very warm welcome to the latest edition of our Stories from the Strong Room series. If you haven't already, remember to click that little bell icon so that you'll be notified each month when a new video goes live. Today we'll be taking a tour through the history of the largest of Hull's parks, East Park. East Park has grown in size over the years through a number of gifts of land. At approximately 130 acres, East Park has offered ample space for a wide range of events, sports and leisure activities, including football, cricket, swimming, bowls, a boating lake, a model boating lake, children's play areas, more recently the park run, and of course it is somewhere to enjoy a nice stroll on a fine day, even better with an ice cream in hand. In this talk, we'll look at the origins of East Park and we'll go on a whistle-stop tour through some of the park's best known and much-loved features through the years, including the park's huge boating lake and the notorious splash boat that continues to soak families to this day. The official opening of East Park was on the 21st of June, 1887, and it coincided with Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. It was the second of two official openings in Hull that day. The first was the opening of the covered market in the morning, but by the afternoon crowds of people gathered and took up every vantage point in Lowgate, Whitefrogate and any other streets through which the parade was to pass on its way to East Park to celebrate its official opening. Members of the corporation met at the town hall and at 2.30 in the afternoon, the procession began with the police band leading and the mayor and his friends following in carriages. The procession began down Lowgate, turning into Whitefrogate and along Savile Street, where the friendly and trade societies taking part in the demonstration joined in. Of the societies, the Knights of the Golden Horn, arrayed in their dazzling uniforms, took the lead, followed by the Springbank Orphans Home, employees of the Hull Blind Institute, the Peter Cross Whitfield Lodge of Oddfellows, and with the ancient order of foresters bringing up the rear. When the procession arrived at the park, the mayor, sheriff, corporation, and many visitors took their places on the platform. The Reverend J.J. Beddo offered a prayer. Alderman Chapman thanked the mayor and corporation for providing that part of the town with the park and suggested the city's newest public space should in fact be named in honour of the Queen. And the mayor declared the park open. The name suggested by Alderman Chapman, however, never quite caught on and the park continues to be known as East Park. Alderman Hodge, a long-time participant in Hull's civic affairs, had first suggested a park for the eastern part of the town many years before it came to fruition. He lived and worked in East Hull, having a house on Holderness Road on the corner of what later became Morrill Street, with his oil mill further up the road. It was 20 years after Hull's first public park was opened, originally called the People's Park and later named after its initial instigator, Zachariah Charles Pearson, that official moves were made to establish other parks for the east and west districts of the rapidly expanding town. And it came at a time when unemployment was high. Holderness Road was the obvious thoroughfare upon which to seek a site for the East District. An 11-man park special committee was set up and met for the first time on the 12th of May, 1882. A subcommittee of six members, chaired by then Mayor Alderman John Leake, was created to deal with the East District. Various sites were considered. They all had frontages along Holderness Road and all extended back to an open area devoid of housing. The different plots were offered for different fees and the committee finally decided to use the corporation's farmland of 38 acres at the corner of Summer Gangs Road and to purchase lands owned by the Mrs Anne Watson's Trust. Approximately 38 acres were purchased at a rate of £437.10 per acre. That totaled £16,909.07.06. It was mostly pasture land with one field of arable, so like the corporation farmland, it offered virtually a blank sheet upon which to design the park. As with West Park, the design of East Park was conceived by borough engineer Joseph Fox Sharp 
and the park special committee estimated it would cost £22,000 to execute. East Park is reminiscent of Pearson Park to the north of the city, with its carriage drive around its perimeter. The intention, as with Pearson Park, was that land adjoining the park should be later developed for housing, but this didn't happen. The first sod was cut on the 29th of October 1884 by the Mayor Alderman Albert K. Rollett. By 1886, the borough engineer reported that 140 men were employed at East Park to carry out the work, and the majority of the men employed earned up to 18 shillings per week. This was good news for the city, as there had been calls for the work on the park to get underway in order to help reduce the level of winter unemployment. In the years preceding the First World War, East Park was enlarged by several gifts of land from Thomas Robinson Ferrens of Holderness House. Thomas Ferrens is well known throughout Hull. The city's art gallery bears his name, as does Ferrens Way, the road running north to south through the city centre. He was a generous benefactor, successful businessman and MP in the city. His first gift of land to East Park he had recently purchased, approximately 15 acres of land on Holderness Road. On one part with the frontage on Holderness Road itself, Mrs Ferrens intended 12 almshouses to be erected for aged people. The rest of the land, Mr Ferrens wanted to build a playing field for children up to the age of 14 years. The corporation agreed and he handed it over to be used for that purpose in perpetuity. It was named King George V Playing Field, and in July 1912, swings and seesaws were bought and a play area established with a large stepped mound with slides on four sides. As you can see here, it also had a paddling pond being enjoyed by many as a place to dip your toes and to cool off from the summer heat. A second donation of land was offered by Mr Ferrens in June 1912, of a field containing eight acres. The land in question lay between the recreation ground and East Park, and in his letter to the corporation, Mr Ferrens offered the land on proviso that it be dug out to the depth of around two feet and six inches, so that it be available for boating to provide what he called a further inducement for young people to take their recreation in the open air. A boating lake with islands was constructed in the winter spring of 1912 to 13. Tenders were sought for single and double sculling skiffs and at the suggestion of Thomas Ferrens, a small motorboat, which he suggested could be used for trips around the lake. Mr Ferrens wasn't the only donator to the park. In 1912, a watchtower from Hull's old citadel dating back to the late 17th century was presented to the Hull Corporation. The watchtower had been preserved since 1864 by Bailey Leatham and Company when they took over the shipyard of Martin Samuelson and Company and built the watchtower into the walls of the renamed Humber Ironworks. The tower had been removed when part of the garrison area was being made into the former Victoria Dock, which opened in 1850. In 1912, it was moved and installed close to the entrance of the Khyber Pass, where it was used in many a game of hide and seek, as well as, I'm afraid to say, as rumour will have it, a toilet for those caught short. The watchtower was moved to its current home at Victoria Dock Village in 1991. In the late Victorian period, concerts in all the Hull parks were regular and well-attended events. By the early 1900s, concerts held in the parks on Friday and Saturday evenings were so popular that the Watch Committee received a deputation from the local branch of Shop Assistance Union to point out that around 5,000 people were employed in shops, but they didn't usually finish work until around 8.30pm, with some shops open until as late as 9.30 on Fridays and midnight on Saturdays. Thus girls of 13 and 14 years of age working in the shops never had a chance to hear the music. Dancing has always been a firm favourite pastime. After the Second World War, the council converted a first aid post in East Park into a ballroom, which opened on New Year's Eve 1948. The Ministry of Fuel gave permission for the premises to be heated and there was an event on most nights of the week. 
East Park offers ample space for hosting large scale events. And since the 60s, numerous music events like Party in the Park, the Humberside Pop Festival in 1969 and Feel the Noise in 2001 have been hosted in the park, as well as a variety of events like the annual Hull Show, various carnivals and circuses throughout the years, Awakening, an event brought to us by the City of Culture team, and recently the annual Big Malarkey, to name but a few. We cannot talk about East Park without mentioning the much-loved Splash Boat. It's etched in the memory of many a visitor to the park. Built by the City Engineers Department, the Splash Boat opened in 1929. It cost two pence for adults and a penny for children to climb the iron steps to a height of 22 feet before enjoying the thrill of the 78 foot water chute to the lake below and no doubt being drenched in the process. On a fine day during the school holidays, as many as 2000 tickets were sold. The boat itself cost the grand sum of 1400 pounds and was built by Charles Wicksteed and company who were renowned for making bicycles, small machine tools and playground equipment. The tower that houses the boat was built by Hull Corporation and cost just over £474. During the Second World War, the water chute house suffered damage in the air raids of the 7th to 9th of May 1941. In 2010, it closed for two years due to damage. And in 2015, the water chute closed while coots were nesting close to the rails. Today, the splash boat is a grade two listed building and is only one of three Wicksteed splash boats to survive in the country. The others are at Scarborough and Kettering. Since the Second World War, East Park has undergone numerous changes, particularly to its many pools and lakes. A number have been filled in, including the ornamental lake in the 1950s, the Peter Pan Lake to the east of the boating pool in 1956, and the paddling pool in the King George V playing fields in 1960. Accidents at the paddling pool led to the addition of a metal chain link fence to the boating lake side of the pool to keep young children away from the big lake. After the bathing pond's closure, however, it was impossible to keep children from bathing in the boating lake during hot weather, so plans for better bathing facilities were considered. At a parks committee meeting, it was recommended that construction of an open air lido should begin in the Festival of Britain year in 1951. However, it wasn't until the 1960s, with post-war reconstruction and repairs mostly complete, that the Lido became a possibility. Local firm Stepney Contractors Limited began construction of the Lido in 1963, and due to the winter being mild and work progressing well, the Lido was ready for testing by Easter 1964. The construction of a building for the housing of pumps, boilers, filter, chlorination plants and changing rooms followed. Families spent many a happy day cooling off in the Lido during the long summer months of the 1960s and 70s. The Woodford Leisure Centre was opened in 1985 on land intended for housing in the original design. Following the opening of the Woodford Leisure Centre, as well as other public baths across the city, in conjunction with the Lido having technical issues, numbers using the Lido declined and it was closed down and demolished in 1988. More recently, in 2020, the play park underwent refurbishment and a new splash pad added to replace the old splash pool, which includes water play jets reminiscent of those in Queen Victoria Square. In his survey of Hull Parks in 1948, E. Prentice Mawson recommended the complete redesign of East Park. Although it was not implemented, as we've seen since the Second World War, East Park has undergone numerous changes. One of the park's oldest features, the ornamental gates and fence, had been taken for salvage at the onset of the Second World War. And after the war, it was not priority to replace them. In fact, it wasn't until July 1964 that the new main entrance to East Park came into being. The ornamental cavity block walls with their geometric shaped design received some criticism at the time as they were deemed a poor replacement to their Victorian predecessors. And it was believed they wouldn't last. But they've stood the test of time and remain in place almost 60 years later. 
Although parts of the park were adapted in the 60s, much of the original layout of the park has been retained. A small zoo was introduced in 1963 on the site of the irregularly shaped lake of Joseph Sharp's design. As part of a multi-million pound refurbishment in 2008, the zoo was revamped and a giant walk through aviary and animal education centre was added to the park, housing a wide range of domestic, farm and exotic animals, from guinea pigs, goats and sheep to alpacas, wallabies and peacocks. It hosts events to educate people of all ages about animals and wider nature and environmental topics. In this talk, through the park's development and history, we've seen how visitors to East Park have spent their leisure time over the years. East Park is held in fond memory by many of its visitors, and it continues to this day to be an open space enjoyed by many. If you've enjoyed this whistle stop tour of Hull's East Park, be sure to check out our channel where you'll find tons of other videos telling the stories we found in our archival treasure troves here at the Hull History Centre. Until next time, thank you for listening. Bye.